I'm going to try to draw a hydrogen atom here. And all of this is stuff that you've seen now, but I think mathematically speaking, now it begins to make a lot more sense, or at least it did for me when I learned it. Uh, if you ever look up speed circle drawing, it's a competitive sport of sorts. Uh, where people can just do this and they get like a perfect circle like and you can measure it with like 1% and there's like literally like you know people who can just in like a tiny fraction of a second just do a perfect circle. Uh, it, it, it's fascinating. <laughs> um, but I'll just draw the first three levels here and um, so this is this is kind of the the physical interpretation you know we have that equation for energies and we can now physically analyze what that means. So what Bohr said is that each of those ends that appear in this equation corresponds with a specific uh, orbital level. And if you kind of just isolate it like this, you can think of it as a ladder. That at the center of it, you're on floor zero. You can never actually take the elevator or, or well, think of it as an elevator, I guess. You can never reach floor zero on an elevator. The lowest you can go is floor one. Um, you can't go down to the basement for whatever reason. So that first level is what we call n equals one. That next level is what we call n equals two that next level we call n equals 3, and so on. As it turns out, the way that he diagrammed this is absolutely not how the electron works, but we'll pretend it is for now. So what he said is that if that electron is going around in level 1, the energy of level 1 is simply HCr, or HCr0. If that electron wants to or, or, well, let's go back one more second. Bohr viewed the, 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 the lowest energy down here, the n equals 1 energy, as the electron moving around in a circle very close to the nucleus at exactly that orbital radius right here. If the electron gains a little bit of energy, it can take the elevator up to floor 2. Now that electron has a wider radius, it will end up going a little more slowly. It has a different amount of energy given by E2 equals HC R0 over 4. To make this work out, what he also did was said, these energies actually are going to be negative. And I, I don't really have a better way to explain this other than just accept it and things start to work out. So um, the reason why he said that actually, I do a better way. They're what we call binding energies. We can, um, just see. that it's kind of like the proton has sucked the electron in by, by electromagnetic um, attraction. And in order to release that energy and like just let that energy float off away with no overall energy, we have to give it some given amount of energy. It's about 12 electron volts. So it's kind of like the electron has dug itself into a hole at about negative 12 EVs at the ground level. And, and I wish I had this off, to, off the top of my head, but I don't. So it's about 12 EVs. Now, for that electron to move up to level 2, we have to give it, turns out, roughly about 8 EVs. And at some point, I did have these numbers. Let me see. Uh, okay, so for that first level, if we view it as negative, uh, that means that basically, by, by pull, for the proton pulling the electron in, it has, there is a binding energy of 13.6 EVs. And if we think back to the photoelectric effect, that's precisely what that work function was. So this is the amount of energy that the, that the proton has exerted on the electron that we have to give the electron at least that much energy to release it. If the electron is in state number 2, it has a binding energy of HCr0 over 2 squared or over 4, which that, that does accurately come out there. So if the electron happens to be at level 2, we only have to give it 3.4 EVs to escape. If the electron is in energy level 3, we are now at HCr0 over uh, 9. And by the way, there's also, I think you just, we typically write that as a single constant like E0 or something like, or E1. Um, but I'll just leave it as that. And so it's like the electron has certain energies where it's allowed to be at but you, it can't arbitrarily choose some energy between that. It can't arbitrarily choose an energy between that. 
it can either be at that energy, that energy, that energy, or as we go on. Now, as it turns out, when we calculate these energies, it's like we're going closer and closer down uh, up to zero. And we can kind of graphically draw that by, by saying, here is our E1, here, and there's a big gap, here is E2, here is E3, and I'm gonna have to start erasing these. I will write a couple more. Here is E4, and they do get geometric, or not quite exactly geometrically close together, but they get closer together according to some, you know, formula, and so on. And if the electron happens to be in one of these higher energy levels, let's say n equals three, it will, after some amount of time, for some reason we don't fully understand, but we know it will happen eventually with a guaranteed probability, that electron eventually will just spontaneously lose some energy. And one of two things will happen. So if it's already at level three, if it loses some random amount of energy, it will either uh, disappear and then immediately reappear at level two, or it will disappear and immediately reappear at level one. Now, and, and like if you had a video camera and watched this happen, you have an electron that's going around here, and if you could put it in as slow motion as possible, that electron had previously been at level three. When it disappears, you would think that you should be able to watch it kind of slowly migrate down to level two and then reappear, but no matter how slowly you, you replay that, you will never see the electron ever at any point between levels three and two. It's like at one instant it was there, at the next, at the, the very next instant it was right there. There is no in between. And this is one of the weirdest things that, that is true in the universe. But this is physically what would happen. That it makes a instantaneous leap. And by the way, that's exactly what we call a quantum leap. Um, people in the, who grew up in the 80s would know that that was a, a TV show. But if the electron happens to jump or it happens to lose energy, disappears from level two, reappears, or sorry, disappears from level three, reappears in level two, the amount of energy it's lost is exactly whatever that Bohr formula predicted, setting Ni equal to three and F equal to two. Let me draw it like this. So when that happens, the amount of energy that it gives off in this case here is gonna be exactly the amount of energy that, that, that's the difference there. And in the process of doing so, it will give off a wavelength of light. And so we can diagram that here, and we can say that by falling from level three to level two, we're gonna give off a photon that has a wavelength, in this case here, 656 nanometers. And that should sound familiar. Um, this is what we call the H alpha emission line. This is the, the single most important um, wavelength in all of astronomy uh, because this is the most prominent wavelength that, that what we call excited hydrogen gives off. And let me explain, and well, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. But that energy difference going from level three to level two is, is an absolute identifier of hydrogen in the universe because no other element, uh, at least common element, gives off wavelengths at close to that. Um, but what, what could also happen is that, uh, that I want to use a color code in here, that electron, if it's in level three, it could drop down to level one. So we can draw that here as going from three to one. Now let's say we have a fourth energy level. If that electron was at n equals four, which we'll draw it here. If that electron's at level four, it could do the same thing. It could fall down from level four to level three, or it could fall down from four to two, or four to one. So for level four, we could fall from four to three, we could fall from four to two, we could fall from four to one. If we're at a level five, if there's some level five up there, I'll do it in black. So I'll do it here. 
If we're at n equals five, we could fall to four, we could fall to three, we could fall to two, we could fall to one. And I'll di diagram that here. If we're at five, we go from five to four, five to three, five to two, five to one. Uh, and I'm just gonna get rid of that there. Uh, and I'll draw one more, E6. If we begin at level six, we could drop down, let's see what I haven't used. Down there, drop down there, drop down there. So what we're seeing here is we are now actually, um, oh, and then there's one more I need to draw here, this one here. These transitions form a mathematically predictable series. These transitions form a mathematically predictable series. These transitions form a mathematically predictable series. And this is what we started our lecture with. These transitions here, we see there is a very large change in energy, and this isn't even to scale. This first energy jump here is about 10 EVs. And if you were to do the math, if, if you calculate what wavelength would a photon have, if it carried with it about 10 EVs, turns out a 10 EV photon is going to be energetic enough that it's, it's, the wavelength is so short our eyes can't see it. So for a jump in energy where it begins at any higher level and falls down to the ground state, which I have here, it will always result in a UV photon being emitted. And that's precisely what uh, Lyman had recognized. This is the Lyman series. Hi, Lenny. I'm not petting anybody. <laughs> hey, buddy. Good boy. So the Lyman series is precisely the series of transitions that begin at what we call an excited state and drop down to the ground state. So these transitions that end in level one are the Lyman series. These transitions here that begin at an even higher excited state and end at level two are the Balmer series. And notice here that no matter which of these values you choose, if I had done this to scale, the energy difference between anything starting above and ending level two will always be less than any of these. And again, to scale, this the floor will be down at about right there, so you can see that more easily. The passion series right here, as you're probably predicting. Um, and I'll write this out. Lyman series NF equals one. Balmer series NF equals two. Passion series NF equals three. The bracket series are, are the set of transitions that end in level four. And so this is the, the physical interpretation of why hydrogen gives off only discrete predictable wavelengths. It's like you have an elevator that can only stop on the floors, you can't stop on level uh, three and a half. And I mean, th that actually is a fairly reasonable analogy there. And because due to Rydberg and then uh, Bohr and, and the others that came before, we can predict exactly what those energies are. And then the cool thing is we can now work backwards using basic electromagnetism to calculate how far each of those orbitals or each of these, you know, radiuses must be from the proton. So that's what I'm, what, what I'm going to leave as the beginning of next lecture. How can we, based on strictly analyzing the energy differences between these levels, how can we work backwards based on this model to figure out what are the allowed radii of the, of the electron? And then one kind of fun, you know, offshoot of that is how much, or what is the velocity of the electron at each of those uh, radii as well? Um, so that, that's really, I think, where I'm going to stop here, and I, I think this is where the fun really begins. So.